Of the conferences I've participated in, I want to say that this is probably the best organized, and I've, in terms of the intelligence of the planners, and by intelligence I mean uh, you can see an informed, intelligent hand in the creation of the program. I mean, just you'll see when I give my talk after the one that just came up before mine, um, how pleased I was to hear the one just before mine. <laughs> and also, um, I know the way Tammy worked with me, actually. actually you, know, you don't just send in your slides. I got them back and uh, with some very good suggestions. I'm a founder and a shareholder in a Yale startup company called C8 Sciences, and one of the brain training programs I'm going to tell you about is uh, created and distributed by that company. So Hugh von Weisel got the Nobel Prize for showing the degree to which the mammalian brain structure and function are shaped after birth by experience, neurons that fire together, wire together. And the dramatic demonstration of this neuroplastic potential, the Ganga Sir and colleagues at MIT surgically rerouted visual information in newborn ferrets to what is usually the auditory or listening parts of the brain. And they asked two questions. Will the ferrets be able to see with the listening parts of the brain? And what will the auditory cortex look like under the microscope? Because as you know, auditory and visual cortex have very different cytoarchitecture. The visual cortex processes visual information like a TV screen. We call them ocular dominance columns. The auditory cortex is processing tonotopic information, entirely different organization. Turned out the ferrets could see with the listening parts of their brain. And further, you can see here the normal, sorry, no. the normal visual cortex, that's the ocular dominance column, this is what the auditory cortex turned into. The cells had reorganized themselves to it look like a visual cortex, even though it was what we might consider the most hardwired parts of the brain, the earliest sensory processing stages. So people started trying to harness this neuroplasticity for therapeutics. I'm going to talk about three things quickly and then move into talking about applications to what we're interested in here with the focus of our conference. Helping blind people see, improving neurocognition and schizophrenia, and treating geriatric depression. Uh, blind people are uh, wear, uh, put a, a sensor on their tongue. You can see the size of it. And they have cameras that they wear like eyeglasses. And that sensor then produces on their tongue a little electrical signals, just like they would on a TV screen. And the brain processes that information as if it were coming from the retina. And they can see. Sensory substitution device. I started doing work training trying to improve cognitive function in people with schizophrenia through this method because these are major deficits in those people and there's no medication that helps them. So first we demonstrated that patients can engage with a training task, that the cognitive benefits generalize beyond the training task, critical thing to demonstrate. Training indeed affects brain function, effects persist after treatment, and effects transfer to real world function. There have been meta-analyses now with thousands of patients, 40, 60 studies uh, from around the world, pretty much establishing this as an evidence-based treatment, I'll say with somewhat limited effects, but still effects. Here's an example of a paper I published in 2000 in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And what you see here, two axial slices, activation during uh, recall period of verbal memory task, no stimulus input, no output required. Uh, this is what you see in healthy people. And you see the activation in the left inferior frontal cortex, a patient with schizophrenia, absence of such activation. After 10 weeks of training, we see some start to appear. And after 16 weeks of treatment, we've essentially normalized task-related activation in an over 50-year-old man who had spent 15 years, at least, in an institution. Here's a study I did with Mara Spell, cognitive training for a year, together with employment services. and. Uh, this is the employment during the first year with active employment services. Employment services were stopped. Brain training was also stopped. The typical loss of employment in the control group maintained a year later. Employment, those patients significant, work significantly more hours and earn more money. A more recent study with geriatric depression. 
And this moves us to, uh, you'll see, issues relevant to, to our deliberations today. A group from Cornell came to me and said, we have identified a target. We've identified a cognitive and neural system you know, with fMRI and behavioral testing that when it's abnormal, patients don't respond to medication. And can you create a brain training program that will address that target? So we did. Uh, the people at Cornell said, okay, you have, you have um, pay, we'll give you some patients who failed three months of a supervised drug trial, and you can treat them with your program for four weeks because we have new medicines we want to give them. Eight of the 10 were recovered in four weeks. One dropped out of treatment. And when you compare that sample to a Lexapro treated sample, who were not pre-selected for failing medicine, significantly faster improvement, reached the same benefits in four weeks that it took 12 for the medicine to achieve, and uh, also there were gains in cognition in the brain treatment group. So our goal is to harness neuroplasticity to prevent and treat addictive disorders. And I'm gonna talk about two things. I'm gonna talk about primary prevention first. Could we really use this as, a, can we really introduce primary prevention here? And the model for that is something that is ongoing, and it's to improve executive function and attention in elementary school children. Now, there's some school systems who say executive function is important for learning, but it's also a life skill. And that we need, one of our educational missions is not just to treat his, teach history facts, but it's to improve executive functions for self-regulation, processing information, and so forth. So executive functions, as you know, a group of thinking or cognitive abilities essential for managing information and managing oneself. What are they good for in terms of the school setting? They are the predictors of whether you succeed in school. I just want to call your attention to the bottom red highlighted uh, study. They followed 2,000 children for 16 years to see if they ever graduated from high school after assessing attention when they were six years old. If you had attention problems when you were six years old, you were eight times more likely to become a high school dropout. I don't have to tell you all what that means in terms of our topic today. If you're a high school dropout, you have a much higher rate of substance abuse. So that's the idea of primary prevention. I'm gonna show you a, an example of, of a program that we're actually doing in the schools today to give you an operational feel for it, and then we'll talk about other, as, other ways we could apply this approach. Uh, the first, uh, just to show that it works, um, this was a large school system. They put uh, kindergarten, first and second grade children on a program, about 1,000 kids. And we built in tests from the NIH toolbox of tests of executive function. We were the first ones actually to make them web-based so that it could be administered in a classroom. So we have the biggest database in the world on, on the NIH tests. We also had 300 million data points in our database from school, just to show you what the technology enabled neuroscience when delivered in the community, can, opportunities it can produce. But here you see a baseline of a uh, Franklin test for focused attention, kindergarten, first, second grade at baseline. So you're seeing the age-related differences you would expect. It gives us confidence in the validity of a classroom administered test over the web by teachers. And then we're also engaging with a neural system and process that are actively developing during this period. You see highly significant improvement in, after four weeks of training in these children. And you see that the kindergartners are at a above first grade level. Uh, so they gained a year by that measure in, in uh, four um, months of training. Here's a NIH funded study. We're doing a randomized controlled trial, but you'll see here uh, for ADHD, a non-pharmacologic treatment for ADHD, targeted again, again, executive function systems. And this is the go-no-go test, the response inhibition. ADHD kids, typically developing kids. Again, what you would expect shows the validity of capturing the data this way. Both show improvement, and the ADHD kids in four months get very close to what uh, non-ADHD kids were to start with. It actually translates in schools to benefit. This was a school with 95% free lunch. So these are children who come to, this is also, of course, the population that has a higher incidence of substance abuse. They come to school without having had the stimulation they need before they get to school to promote development of these neurocognitive systems. They're put in a school where demands are made of them that they're not neurocognitively prepared to meet. And that sets off this even developmental tra trajectory of such cost. So uh, this was a uh, second grade, a uh, third grade class uh, reading test by Pearson, a big education company. This reading test in third grade happens to predict very highly whether you graduate from high school. This was district-wide scores. Reading means that uh, you're meeting uh, standards 
Uh, yellow means you're just below, and red means you're in big trouble. Uh, District-wide data in the fall and the spring. District-wide data in one class that got the teacher assigned to give our program. You can see the improvement in a test, third-party administered test. Um, ADHD data. Here we're comparing uh, control group to, uh, to the group that got a program. Why do I mention ADHD at all? Well, ADHD is another group that is a higher substance abuse issue, right? So this is, again, talking primary prevention at an early age. Um, I don't have that much time, so I'm going to say that this particular study, what we've seen according to parent ratings of ADHD symptoms, they're twice as likely to, for children to show a 30% improvement if they got our program as compared, compared to, to the control group. The problem with parent ratings is they're not blind. The advantage of parent ratings is they see the kids in many situations, so they have more information. But I told you we have those NIH tests built into our program, so I was able to say the kids who parents said, whose parents said they got better clinically, that's one group, and there's another group whose parents said they didn't get better clinically, so we could look at, see what happened to them cognitively. And uh, this is one of those, few moments in a long career where you really feel excited when you get the slide information back from your, uh, because what happened to kids whose parents said they got better showed improvements in, in response inhibition and focused attention. The kids whose parents said they didn't get better didn't show those improvements. So A, the parents were right, and B, if you got better symptomatically, you got better cognitively after uh, four months of treatment. So what does our program consist of? Computer presented brain training exercises, I'll describe them a little bit, physical exercises, Increased neuroplasticity with physical exercise, increased academic performance with physical exercise, but we uh, also design the physical exercises to have cognitive components so they engage the same target neural systems as do the computer exercises, but in the context of whole body activity and social interaction. And then assessment. I already told you that we have built in the NIMH test, uh, toolbox tests. But in addition, while the children are doing our brain training programs, we capture every keystroke. We get 25,000 responses per child. We're able then to apply algorithms to those and generate what is like a neuropsych profile um, and put it together with the NIH test to generate reports for the schools or any research group about uh, a similar to a neuropsych test. So what do these games look like for kids? Uh, we have a, a six games, uh, two pairs, uh, two of them. We'll take Treasure Trunk and Magic Lens, the exact same computer code, exact same series of cognitive challenges, two faces on them to create variety. Kids are given choice first. They play each game for five minutes, and then they get another choice screen. We monitor their choices so that we don't give them choices if they play a game too often. And, um, we also now have 350,000 game choices by the kids so that we can use that to help us create the next generation of programs. So just to give you a sense for each, uh, one game, how this works. How much time are we doing time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes still. Seven. Yeah, okay, good. So uh, each game has hundreds of levels. And you've probably heard a lot about brain training games. And uh, some people say they work. Some people say they don't work. Well, you wouldn't be surprised. The answer is some work and some don't work. <laughs> and, uh, and the difference is in how they make, uh, what the Neuroscience Foundation is, and the secret sauce of how they actually work. So our games have hundreds of levels, and our secret sauce is really our ability to know when's the right time to meet, move each user to a different type of challenge. So the program actually shapes itself to each user's profile of strengths and weaknesses. So this program, this game, starts with just one yellow orb floating around the screen. And all the child has to do is click on them and it turns red. If they get it right, it moves faster. If they make mistakes, it slows down. But just to stay in attention. Then after the right level, when they move up to the next level, it sometimes turns blue. They're not supposed to click blue. The game hasn't changed. Blue happens. What do some little kids do? Click. Oh no, I'm not supposed to do that. Response inhibition has been introduced. Next stage up, the target flips back and forth between blue and red. And there's a little clue up the top there. What are you supposed to be looking for? What was a target seconds ago has to be ignored. So we've increased the response and efficient demand and added cognitive flexibility. The next level's up. You only click on a blue one. If, if this turns blue, you only click on it if it was blue before. So it's just a one back test. But now we've added working memory into the same game. No more instructions needed. Some kids in the classroom will be doing one level. Some kids in the classroom will be doing another level. 
then you have two of these things going around the screen at the same time. So you've added multiple simultaneous attention and it increased the cognitive demands and all the others. So uh, Tammy wanted me to give you a feel for what the games actually consist of. Uh, this is the other game that's the exact same code, but now it's a magic lens that jumps around. And if the, at the beginning you're just looking for that kind of monkey as opposed to other monkeys, and if that monkey's in the circle, you click on it, the monkey gets out and runs away. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on that one with a game design company. The kids liked the first one better. Psychologist said to me, yeah, hoarding. They want the jewels. And I <laughs> the, ga the game designers told me a uh, core principle of game design is to help somebody in the game. <laughs> and that's an engagement feature. And we can talk later about engagement features, good and bad. Uh, this is just a pattern recognition game. A duck, when you make, create the right pattern, the ducks all fly off and look happy. Physical exercises, as I said, are designed to have cognitive components. They also start simple. So the beginning level physical exercise, this is my space, another child's in their space. Now I can stand on one leg, pay attention to my body. We haven't quite got into mindfulness yet, but we do have um, all different poses that they're supposed to do, but to pay attention to yourself. At higher levels, here's a half a dozen people will be in a circle. We'll give one of them a green bean bag. You'll throw it to somebody else, has to throw it to somebody else, so you have a little pattern for the green bean bag. I'll give John a red bean bag, and he has to create another pattern. And we put both green bags in at the same time, and then the children have to say thank you by name to the person who threw it to them. So uh, you can see multiple simultaneous attention, working memory, response inhibition. When you get the red one, you kind of know where you're going to throw it. Five minutes, or how are we doing? Okay. Okay, so treating addiction with brain and cognitive training. I already talked to you about the possibility of primary prevention, but now we're talking about treatment. And this builds right on the last lecture about uh, what would be the right targets in terms of, and can we accelerate that recovery process? So the key thing in designing these games is to select the appropriate neurocognitive dysfunction to target. And that's why I told you the example with the depression. I mean, that was, that was published in Nature Communications last summer. It was the most powerful result we found because we had a very clean target to go after. I am really encouraged by the natural recovery with abstinence. Um, so uh, the first thing is the target, and I'll talk just a little bit about that, uh, but that's what this conference is about in a way, the way I'm seeing it. You know, what is the target? How do we use various methods of imaging and, 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 and cognitive assessments to, uh, to figure out what is wrong that we could try and fix? So you need some sophisticated game design once you've picked the target. That's the secret sauce. That's the idea that not all games are the same. Uh, also, there is a question that you, have to, you want to use gaming features to promote engagement, but you don't want them to exacerbate the problem. I mean, very quick ideas. Uh, example, kids with ADHD can play certain computer games for hours. How is that? Those games are high arousal, high stimulation, arcade-like environment games that bypass, in my opinion, the executive control systems, hijack attention through lower brain regions. What are those lower brain regions close to and interact with? Addictive centers. And uh, so that creates a challenge, of course, for creating a game these kids will do. But you can see that you have to be careful about things like that. Okay, so I had two thoughts before coming here, but these are really just as examples, conversation starters, because you all know much more about the pathology than I do. But one I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, as you can see it's stated by the words itself, <laughs> that would be the just, no, just say no training, and that would maybe the cognitive control mechanisms you're talking about, but how could we, uh, and to me it seems like it would not be difficult to create training games that activate and challenge that system, and you can add uh, all sorts of challenges in the background to it. And then there's a question of how do we remediate substance-related pathology? So this is, understand, different question. I'm, can the just say no is sort of coming from a behavioral level, but we've got more sophisticated idea of what's wrong with the brain from the alcohol or predispositions predisposition to alcohol, we could talk about another, another way to go into that. So, uh, somebody, uh, I guess it was the last talk, said that attention and working memory may be particularly compromised. There is, I can tell you, an attention training game now that is incredibly sophisticated for adults. I know because I designed it, and I know it's the most sophisticated attention training game ever made. It's created by a company in the UK called Peak, P-E-A-K. 
they have an in-house you know, team of designers and um, developers. Uh, Apple participated in the launch with them at the end of May. Apple identified it as the top education app of, uh, of the month. And so I'm, 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 I'm pitching it because I think it's, it's real. I know the field well, and it's out there now. And it's uh, being marketed as an app uh, to use on uh, phone or mo uh, mobile or tablets, not on computers. And right now they're marketing it at $30. So it's not a pitch, but I'm doing, I'm trying to tell you it's not an expensive intervention. And it, uh, uh, and take, uh, I'll end by giving you a little more feel for these types of games. So attention. How do you train attention? What's involved in attention? How many different dimensions are there in attention? So one thing I told you is you can be tracking something that's moving very fast. So you can adaptively track. A game's adaptively track something. You get it right, it goes, gets harder, make mistakes, it gets easier. But uh, another dimension is how long is the target exposed for? That's a whole separate dimension of it, being able to attend. This game actually adaptively tracks both at different levels so we can make the target duration smaller and smaller. But what about discriminatory attention? So you have to discriminate a target from a foil. So we have other levels with foils, and then the foils become more and more similar to the targets, to challenging that. What about distraction? That's another whole is issue of attention. So we have distractors built in at different levels, and all different levels of, of distraction. And finally, we have the question of the frequency of targets. And I call this the secret service dimension of attention training. Secret service, attention, maintain it, Six years for one event, right? So it's harder for people to maintain attention when there's very low frequency. So when you talk about how I uh, wonder about brain training games and cognitive remediation, I just want to give you a flavor of how, uh, of how complex they need to be. And then they can all, as I say, adaptively track. Thank you.